Hi everyone, thanks for joining us. Um, I'm going to follow on a previous talk, namely how long does how long does protection last after you've been exposed to COVID either naturally um, or via vaccination? And to study that, we looked at an animal model. Uh, we didn't look at antibody levels, but we did look at the amount of shedding and the capacity for that shedding, shed virus, to reinfect naive animals. So we used a native rat virus called STAV. Um, this is a, a rat-specific beta coronavirus that is very closely related to the seasonal human coronaviruses we get. Um, its next closest neighbor is MERS, and then the next one after that is SARS-2. And it causes a relatively mild interstitial pneumonia that is transient. The animal recovers in 10 to 14 days. So it's not a great model of lung injury. However, it is a good model of transmission because all of the essential features of SARS-CoV-2 transmission are replicated in this virus. So we used SDAV to model transmission of SARS-CoV-2. We also used another rat coronavirus, also quite closely related, to model vaccination. And so the analogy here would be a live viral vaccination. Our intent for creating this data is then to put it all into an SEIRS model, which is a mathematical model, to um, model epidemic to endemic transition which is what we're doing now. All I'm going to present today is the in vivo data. So these, this is how we modeled initial exposure to STAV. Um, the, the capacity to generate an immune response is dependent not only on the individual, um, but on the mode of exposure. So the higher the viral exposure, generally the better the immune response. So we wanted to model high risk and low risk exposures. We started off with inoculating rats with known amounts of virus and then exposed those to recipient rats via a couple of routes. The first was via direct contact. Um, and then our low risk exposures were fomite exposures. One was a fomite cohabitation model where after the fomite exposure, the recipients are co-housed. So if one got it, it could give it to another via direct route. And in the other, they were singly housed, and that was our lowest risk exposure. Um, so we see that when we separate all of these recipients out, uh, these are our positive controls throughout. So these are animals that are inoculated, that are red. We see that their PCR positivity rate, so these animals were swabbed five, for five days sequentially after exposure. Um, their, their PCR positivity rate is 100%. So um, pretty much similar between direct inoculation and direct contact, and they all seroconverted. And then as we go down to our lower risk exposures, their PCR rates go down and so do their seropositive rates go down. Um, just to note the, the CQ, this is the cycle number, low is more. Um, so this is the threshold at which you detect the virus. And we see that with direct inoculation and direct exposure, we're looking at around 28 to 29 cycles. And then the shed amount of shed virus is much lower with the lower risk exposures, which is what we expect to see. We also notice that shedding exceeds conversion. So the virus can replicate in the nose and be shed and be detected as a positive test, but it doesn't penetrate the body enough to actually induce seroconversion. And the point of that is that even though you test positive to extrapolate to COVID, it doesn't mean you've developed immunity to the virus. This is what happens after a break of three and a half to four and a half months. Um, after the initial exposure, we have two populations. We have seronegative rats that never seroconverted and seropositive rats. In the seronegative group, when we expose them with the same paradigm, we see very much the same results. So that's driven by the risk of exposure. And in our seropositive group, we see that even those animals that are seropositive that have seen the virus that their immune systems have responded, a fair number of those overall close to 60% will share the virus and re-exposure. And the group to look at is this group here, red. So these are animals that got SDAV intra intranasally and then got the same dose intranasally again. So they got the highest exposure, highest immunity, and then highest re-exposure. And even those animals still shed at about 40%. However, the cycle times are much higher, which means that the amount of virus shed is much lower. Next, we looked at 
whether these animals that were shedding, immune animals, shedding virus at low amounts could actually give the virus to naive animals. Um, this is what we see on natural exposure. So these are our animals that got one dose of SDAV intranasally, waited three and a half to four and a half months, got a second dose and then co-housed them with naive animals. And almost a quarter of those animals, those naive animals shed the virus and seroconverted. With vaccination, um, we vaccinated animals. Now we waited a shorter amount of time. So that's analogous to what's happening now. We exposed, exposed those animals to naive animals. We up the bar. So we exposed them for seven days. And we see that we only see 14% um, of infections. So, and, and at that point, the seropositivity is much lower. So it means that they're shedding very low amounts of the virus that can transmit to animals, but at a very low rate. It's tempting to think vaccination is better and it's certainly more consistent, it's more controllable. Um, however, we should also note that the time between vaccination and exposure is much shorter here. Whereas in the top with the natural exposure paradigm, it's a little bit longer. So this really models what is happening currently where you have people that were exposed by natural infection and their immunity is probably waning at this point um, compared to people who are being vaccinated currently. So to conclude uh, with natural exposure and re-exposure, I think every piece of data produced by scientists that tells us that herd immunity via natural exposure is not a good way to go. Again, this is one more piece of data to say that. Natural exposure gives you very heterogeneous immunity and on re-exposure, the risk of shedding is high across the diversity of immunity that you see with natural exposure. And that amount of shedding can cause transmission to a naive person. With vaccination, greater protection in the short term, um, but it is likely that that protection is also going to wane over time. So overall, it, I would say it looks likely that this disease is here to stay. Um, and probably requires revaccination on a regular basis. Currently, what we're doing is applying this data to our SEIRS model, where we're going to introduce the notion of respiratory infection as well. Uh, with the, that's a sort of low to high risk. The, the entire spectrum is, is housed within respiratory infection. So I'd like to stop there um, and thank the NSF for funding this. <laughs>